Hi everyone, this is Wei Chen from Phuket, Rio de Janeiro. So today I would like to share with you our recent work on the issue of generalizing the uh, Berry curvature and quantum metric in solids into the systems that contain many body interactions. And this brings into the notion of Feynman diagrams for uh, these quantities. Now the system that we are interested in are the gap materials that have well-defined um, uh, field band states and empty band states. Um, in particular, for instance, we are interested in semiconductors that have um, uh, valence bands and conduction bands. Now, because we're interested in fermions, so we consider that each state, okay, so as labeled here as a UA1, UA2, all the way up to UA, M minus. Let's suppose we have M minus such bands all together. They, are, they, they may be degenerate, may not be degenerate, and may include spins and so on, but it doesn't matter for our uh, calculation. Now, but the point is that because they are um, uh, fermion, fermionic states, so you have to make it fully anti-symmetric and to construct a, a fully anti-symmetric slater determinant states. Now, out of the states, uh, you can think of it as, um, and the state depends on momentum k, right? So you can picture it in the following way. Um, for instance, we know that the uh, um, a quantum mechanical state is a univector in the Hilbert space, right? So suppose your Hilbert space has three components, so let's say three-dimensional Hilbert space, so you denote the basis as n1, n2, and n3. Then your uh, state psi will be a univector that points in some direction in this three-dimensional space. And also it depends on this parameter momentum here. And so you change from momentum k to a different momentum, let's say k plus delta k, then this univector is very rotate. And to further visualize it, we can consider, for instance, a two-dimensional material, some two-dimensional semiconductors or so, now you have momentum kx and ky, and this is your Brillouin zone, which will be a uh, square, for instance. And each point in this Brillouin zone, in this momentum space, has a Hilbert space, which is this three-dimensional uh, Hilbert space here. So at each point, you can define a unit vector of this vector of psi here um, that lives in the Hilbert space at this point of uh, uh, momentum space kx and ky. So physically, it will look like this. Your momentum is 2D, but you each point, you have a little vector that lives in the three-dimensional space. Now, given this, you can define two things. One is the so-called Berry curvature, where uh, let, let us denote the derivative in momentum as partial mu. Here. Then you add, uh, uh, make a dot product of the uh, derivative of the state in the fully in this anti-symmetric way, and you define the so-called Berry curvature. Now, this quantity is very important in solid state physics because it uh, is related to a lot of interesting physical phenomena, such as quantum power effect or anomalous velocity and so on. And that's why we're interested in studying this. And another quantity is the so-called quantum metric, which is uh, physically uh, it means that you are taking this um, quantum state psi k as specific momentum dot product with uh, the same state, but momentum has changed a little bit, psi k plus theta k. Now, you know, because they are unit vectors, so the dot product between the two unit vectors must be less than one. So if you write it as one minus some corrections, then you can do a straightforward expansion, then and you can see that uh, the leading order correction must be quadratic in this data k that you have moved. And the coefficient in the front, g mu mu, defines what we call the quantum metric. And if you expand it straightforwardly, then it takes this particular form as being first proposed by Provost and Marie here. Now, the quantum metric and Berry curvature are actually not independent from each other but they are the real and imaginary part of the more uh, generalized quantity called quantum geometric tensor. So, which is defined as such, 
and this uh, quantum metric is a real part of this guy, and um, the Berry curvature is the imaginary part of this guy. Yeah. And furthermore, uh, one particularly one particular class uh, that this concept can be applied to is the so-called topological insulators. In particular, if you go to uh, two-dimensional topological insulators uh, that are time reversal symmetry breaking, the so-called churn insulators, they are described by the Dirac Hamiltonians, which are some parameterization in momentum space, that product with the sigma, which are the polymetric, uh, which are the poly matrices. And then you can diagonalize it and find the uh, energy dispersion. And it looks like this. So you have a combustion band and you have a valence band. The interesting thing is if you calculate the uh, quantum metric and very curvature of these models, then they are actually related to each other. Namely the square root of the determinant of the quantum metric and the module of the very curvature uh, divided by two are actually equal to each other. Now, this is a more special case of the so-called metric curvature correspondence, which is actually valid for any topological insulator and superconductors in any dimension in any symmetric class. And uh, as listed list here in our previous publication, and also if you are interested, please see my other video, which I had a more detailed introduction about this metric curvature correspondence. But particularly in 2D and time reversal breaking, uh, churn insulators, it is the, a relation between the quantum metric and the Berry curvature. Okay, so these are all very nice. These are all non-interacting uh, states where your your states, you have a state to, to, to begin with. So you can calculate its derivative and all that. But the issue now is uh, what happens in real materials when you have actually a lot of complications such as many body interactions or disorder, and phonons, whatever other stuff, which oftentimes will render this uh the state sign not even a valid state to begin with. Yeah. Now, how do you do this? How do you define the quantum metric? How do you define the curvature? So to do this, uh, we come up with uh linear response theory that says the following: Let us consider that you apply an electric field to the uh to the system, and in, in fact. Uh, practically, this is applying the uh, oscillating uh, uh, electric field, meaning just uh, electromagnetic wave. Now, the perturbation that you can cause on the system is described by the dipole interaction, which is charge times the field times the position operator, which in momentum space will become the derivative in momentum. Yeah, And then you can consider the charge polarization as an operator which is uh, given by this so-called non-abelian berry connection. Namely, you consider a derivative on the uh, uh, on two different states and that product with each other. And then you uh, multiply by the corresponding creation and annihilation operator. This is the most general way to define a charge polarization if you have any many, many states together. Right? And then you can go ahead and consider the uh the expectation of value of this charge polarization uh as induced by the oscillating uh electric field. In other words, you shine on shine light on your material, and you ask what is the um uh charge polarization as being induced by the electric field of the light, and this defines the charge polarization susceptibility. This chi mu nu here which you can calculate using the usual linear response theory uh, 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 as a correlator of this operator here. Then uh, what is interesting is from this susceptibility, you can go ahead and define what we call the quantum metric spectral function. Namely, you take the two indices, yeah, take the quantum, uh, take this susceptibility with the index mu and nu, and with the other one where mu and nu are reversed. So what this means is that you apply a field in the mu direction and you ask what is the charge polarization in the nu direction and the other way around. So combine them in this symmetric way and ask what is the imaginary part of this spectrum function. Then this will define what we call the quantum metric uh, spectral function. The Berry curvature spectrum function likewise is defined in a similar way, but you may 
you need to anti symmetrize it. You need to anti symmetrize your uh, the direction of the light and the uh, charge that it produces. And moreover, it is a real part of this. Now, these formulas, as you can see, they are very similar to this. Uh, the fact that very curvature in quantum metric are the real and imaginary part of the quantum geometric tensor, as I showed you earlier, right? So one is a real part, one is the imaginary part. And the claim is that uh, if you further do a frequency integration, so you get the spectrum function, you integrate it over frequency, then you got exactly the quantum metric and the very curvature. Yeah. So you can do this uh, analytically and show that uh, in the non-interacting case, this really goes back to the previous formula, uh, th this whole formula that I was presenting earlier. But this susceptibility formalism will allow you to add a lot of more complications in real materials. Um, uh, and in fact, the good thing is this susceptibility formalism, the susceptibility itself, this uh, chi mu nu itself that you calculated using linear response theory can be represented by Feynman diagrams. Yeah. So, and in fact, uh, there are many ways you can calculate it. And in practice, uh, just like how you do with perturbation theory. You can calculate up to one loop, two loop, or whatever your computational power allows. And also in practice, there are many approximations to calculate it, yeah. depending on the complication of interactions, right? For instance, the most straightforward way is to, uh, and you know, in the sensibility in a many body language is given by this bubble that is given by this particle hole bubble. Where uh, what it says is that when you have a light coming in and you excite a particle and you excite a hole and later they recombine to become light again. So the magnitude of this particle excitation is precisely uh, the susceptibility that you have. And in the presence of interactions, your particle hole excitation will be dressed by interactions. Yeah. So that's why instead of single line, this is replaced by a double line here. Or you can do this kind of so-called letter diagram approximation, which you take the a bare bubble and then you dress them with the interaction and then other interaction in the middle like this, looking like uh, letters. So this is another approximation. So in practice, you, you know, usually people take either this approximation or the other approximation. And as an example, we can take that churn insulator that I told you earlier, described by a simple direct model, and then you put in disorder, yeah. And then when you put disorders, you can also calculate, you know, up to uh, whatever approximations that you want to calculate. First, you calculate the self-energy by scattering with single impurity or bone approximation here or up to higher low order. So here cross means the impurity and this dashed lines are the uh, impurity potentials. And then your full Green's function will be uh, this uh, diagram means the the usual Dyson's equation. And then you put these double lines up here into the double line here, uh, into this full Green's function approximation. And then the result, for instance, we study this disorder training, right? So first, first of all, this uh, double line itself will already contain some information about the effect of impurities. And as people know, that the effect of impurities is to broaden this single particle spectrum function, which is essentially the imaginary part of this double line here, from a perfect data function to some broadening here. So you see that these lines become slightly broader depending on which momentum they, they, they have. Yeah. And then using this, you, you essentially you put these spectrum functions into here, uh, this double line, and then calculate this um, susceptibility, and then you combine them in the fully symmetric way to get a quantum metric spectral function or fully anti-symmetric way to get very curvature spectral function. And then you can plot them as a function of frequency, right? And as I say, if you integrate it over frequency, then you get a very curvature or you get a quantum metric. And moreover, previously I told you that ideally in a churn insulator, you should have the metric curvature correspondence. So in this case, the square root of the determinant of the uh, quantum metric spectrum function should be equal to the module of the very curvature spectrum function divided by two. So in other words, the uh, 
purple line and the black line should coincide to each other. And they do at large momentum, as you can see. Here, I'm plotting only one black line, but there are actually two lines. There's a black line, there's a, a purple line. They just coincide to each other, meaning that the metric curvature correspondence is satisfied. As we go to smaller, smaller momentum, ah, here they are still satisfied, here they are still satisfied. They are both two lines. But here, when you go to very, very small momentum, where the band gap is very, very small, then they started to deviate. And actually, they deviate quite a lot. So what it says is that the metric curvature correspondence is no longer satisfied. In, in other words, this uh, black and the purple lines are no longer exactly on top of each other. And as you can see, if you integrate them over uh, frequency, then you will get two different values, right? You will get this uh, square root of determinant of G not equal to the module of Bayer curvature. So that means in the presence of interactions, this metric curvature correspondence is no longer valid, especially when your interaction is too strong. So here I would like to comment that um, oftentimes people motivate people are motivated to study these uh, topological materials uh, because you say that ah, the topology is protected by the band gap against a lot of perturbations. Yes, that's true. But here we are showing that, in fact, this is true only if your interaction is weaker than some values. Yeah, If your interaction is too strong, then you can still violate this. Then the topology is no longer well protected. Yeah. And moreover, using this linear response theory and using these Feynman diagrams, you can actually quantify how much it is violated. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much.